And one of the things we're very interested in is creative placemaking. And as we got more and more excited about what was happening with the convention and all these sort of things, we talked to Niels about the idea of bringing the keynote speech out of a hotel and into a place that was right in the texture of Lovecraft's life. Because this was, of course, the church where he went to Sunday school. Uh, briefly. Very, very briefly. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll hear about that in a moment. Um, but I was also so delighted to have Gigi uh, join us as the organist. Not only is she a brilliant organist, She so rose to the occasion as we pitched this, she even learned that Norwegian chant, which we play at Waterfire all the time, and thank you, that was absolutely gorgeous, Gigi. Um, that is one of the Anglesite pieces of Norwegian sort of uh, folk uh, religious tradition, and it, the intention is it's, a, it's an arrow that pierces the heart of you from its sheer beauty. So we thought we'd start with that moment of the sacred before we talk about the misadventures in Sunday school that a certain individual are here to gather. Uh, but I also want to very much thank the First Baptist Church for letting us host this. Stan Remitz is here representing the church as a church historian, and I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Stanley Remitz to come up and talk a little about the founding of this church and Roger Williams and the place of tolerance that Lynn mentioned. Thank you. On behalf of the First Baptist Church in America, I'd like to welcome you to the meeting house. Uh, it's an altogether fitting place for this convention to assemble because uh, H.P. Lovecraft was associated with this. This year, we are celebrating the 375th anniversary of this church. It was spent, it was gathered by Roger Williams in 1638, and. Uh, he would hate this building, probably, but this building itself was built 238 years ago. And I might make the point that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft hated this church, but he loved this building. <laughs> <laughs> I you understand the distinction between the church and the people, and it's theology and all, the building is something else, and he loved this building. Uh, Roger Williams came here, booted out, you know, was banished from Massachusetts today, he came down here and he established the first secular government in modern history, anywhere, where religion and citizenship were celebrated, were separated. He believed in religious liberty, not tolerance. He thought that was a lower kind of thing. He believed in religious liberty. And so he set up a state where church and state were always separated. Lovecraft was briefly a Sunday school student in this church. His mother, his grandmother, and his aunt uh, Lillian and Aunt Hannah were all members of this church having joined in 1883. Lovecraft, of course, was born in 1890 and was, he says, attended his last service here in 1895. He was just five years old. And he also says that he became an atheist by the time he was eight years old. So by 1898, he's out of the place. But he was actually, from outside of our uh, folklore, was kicked out of the Sunday school because he became enamored of the Romans and the Greeks and came to think that they were better than the Christians. And so he said, <laughs> he didn't decide with the lions against the Christians. <laughs> so he was kicked out. And he came back, though, to visit the building. He would take people in here and show them around. But he had only a brief association with the church as a body, but a long association with the building as a place. Thank you, Stan. Um, uh, he's, Dr. Lemons uh, was talking uh, quite precisely about this Providence, specifically the city of Providence, being the first place in the world where a government was established on the principle of freedom, tolerance, and freedom from persecution. So welcome to a city that you'll find to be remarkable in many, many respects, with a great arts community and a wonderful place. And we are in this place in part because Lovecraft was very interested in places. He writes specifically about this in his letters. But he also was a very early preservationist and 
you know, I would make the argument that some of these buildings that we still have here that we can celebrate are because of Lovecraft's interest in the built environment. But he writes that his writings were so inspired by specific places as he felt it was the only visceral experience that could truly move people. So we weave that through some of the things we're adding to the conference this year. And I think you'll find that as you want the province in all these uh, many manifestations. Neil, would you like to come up or are you... Uh... I think Neil should come up, actually. See what I can do with it too. So far, so good. Anyway, uh, once again, to reiterate, uh, I'm essentially just going to repeat all the things that have just been said by several other people who are far better speakers than I am. But first off, uh, absolute thank you so much to all of you for coming out to this. Um, you are absolutely the thing that is making this the, the event that we hope that it is. Um, thank you so much to essentially all of Providence, uh, in particular Barnaby Evans, who hasn't gotten an introduction. Uh, Barnaby was one of the uh, Barnaby and Waterfire, I should say, one of the first people and organizations locally that came on board and essentially almost immediately collected the same sort of dreams that we had. The dream of essentially bringing Lovecraft back to Providence and giving him the throne in Providence that he deserves. So uh, I'd really like to thank Barnaby in particular for that. As you will know, if you come to Waterfire Saturday night. Uh, you will see some of those dreams, some people might call them nightmares, uh, disturbing visions that we shared that uh, almost immediately were like, oh my god, he's suggesting the things that we only dare to dream about. So the fact that those things are now actually this weekend going to be coming um, to fruition is very much in large part thanks to Barnaby uh, and to a number of other people in the room too. Um, is Morgan Gruff here still? Morgan, oh, Morgan Greff over there from the Rhode Island Historical Society, um, one of the other entities in town, one of the other organizations that has always placed uh, an emphasis on Lovecraft as being somebody that Providence should be proud of and, and engaged with as, as a cultural resource. Um, likewise, in fact, the city of Providence as well, Lynn McCormick's office, um, a number of other people in the city hall, including the mayor himself, Mayor Angel Tavares, have, have really come on board and, and see come to see, if not having already seen a long time ago, uh, see Lovecraft as this important cultural resource for us to, um, for us to cherish, essentially. Uh, Lovecraft is certainly an incredibly flawed character. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the tolerance of the colony. It's remarkable that that's what the colony was based on, was this emphasis, um, you know, a shelter for people that were essentially cast out from other places. And, uh, Yet remarkably, um, Lovecraft obviously was not exactly tolerant of many things around him, kind of famously so, um, perhaps infamously so. But again, that's kind of, to me, that's the thing that makes uh, Lovecraft a very fascinating character. And also, I think that's one of the, Lovecraft reflects a lot of the complexity of Providence uh, proper. Providence as a city. There's a lot of different facets to Providence. Um, as I think you will know over the next few days, the vast majority of them are pretty amazing. So I really hope you all get to enjoy a lot of Providence. Like Barnaby said, uh, it was very important to us that we showcase uh, more than just the inside of the convention hall. We wanted you to get out and explore Providence and see the beautiful city that we see. Um, a number of you have already uh, experienced that. I see Mark Morrison nodding his head. Mark, by the way, maybe wins the award for the farthest travel from Australia. Uh, <laughs> Once again, I just really would like to thank, as, as other people have, the church, uh, the First Baptist Church in America, a very significant place for, for us to be able to have this. And in particular, um, again, sort of thanks to Barnaby for having this amazing idea of having Gigi Velasco come and join us. Honestly, like, my vision, my vision for what this evening was going to be like was uh, just shattered entirely. Like, it has been so much more incredibly powerful and moving than I possibly could have dreamed, largely thanks to Gigi. Thank you so much.
So there are three surprises you'll find in, in the church. Um, well, two surprises in the church. The three surprises you'll find. I won't tell you more than that, but pay attention. Um, the water fire, the really working with Niels and all this group, was very intrigued with about placemaking. And there are about 10 different projects that I'm not going to take time to go into that are around and we encourage you to find out. But I do hope you will buy the Eye of Providence t-shirts so that uh, you can go home and talk about the great experience you had in our city. In our city. With that, I would uh, delighted to be introducing S.T. Joshi, uh, our keynote speaker, the leading authority in H.K. Lovecraft, Ambrose Pierce, one of my favorite authors, and H.L. Mencken. We have three fascinating people here. Uh, and uh, authority on the realms of supernatural and fantasy. He's edited many books. You know him very well. You know his work. Please join me in welcoming S.T. Joshi. tidbit to what we said before about uh, Lovecraft's um, love of this church. You remember the famous passage in the call of Pluto, where uh, part of which is set across the street uh, in the Fleur de Lis building, you know, the, uh, an artist studio then and now. Now Lovecraft hated that building because it was, it was, it was Victorian. Uh, anything Victorian was, uh, was a subject of, uh, of loathing for him. And what he wrote in the call of Pluto was, there's the Fleur de Lis building, uh, in Thomas Street, a hideous Victorian imitation of 17th century Breton architecture which flaunts its stuccoed front amidst the lovely colonial houses on the ancient hill and under the very shadow of the finest Georgian steeple in America. <laughs> so, uh, so that's bad, this is good. <laughs> um, what I hope to address here briefly, if possible, uh, briefly, is um, how did Lovecraft get to be world famous? He certainly wasn't world famous in his time. He was a man who did not publish a single book of his stories in his lifetime. Five different occasions, publishers approached him or he approached a publisher about a collection. Every time, those negotiations failed for one reason or another. At the very end of his life, only one Book. One story appeared as a separate book, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, and it was uh, poorly printed, full of typographical errors, distributed only a few hundred copies. I do not doubt that Lovecraft, as he lay dying in his hospital bed at Jane Brown Memorial Hospital, not far from here, in the early morning hours of March 15, 1937, was envisioning the ultimate oblivion that would overtake his work. Lost as it was in those crumbling pulp magazines, which were already then disintegrating into dust, weird tales, astounding stories, amazing stories. Let alone his essays and poetry and letters, some of which had never been published. It would be no surprise if he thought that his work would simply fade away with his own body. But his survival, at least in the short term, was uh, the result of the great devotion of his friends. Robert Barlow, his literary executor, only 19 years old, took a long bus ride from Kansas to Providence to go through his papers after his death and donated the bulk of them to the John Hay Library. An act of incredible foresight because those papers laid the foundation for what, uh, for later scholarship that would uh, raise him to, to, to world stature. August Derleth and Donald Wanderai spent their own money and their time and effort to start the publishing firm Markham House for the specific purpose of, of publishing Lovecraft stories in hardcover. And those, those editions were well received at the start, although I think some reviewers uh, looked upon them more as a tribute to friendship than for, for their purely literary worth. Weird fiction at that time was uh, not highly regarded as a literary form. Uh, most mainstream critics did not believe that you could write genuine literature of, the, of horror and the supernatural. Indeed, in 1945, Edmund Wilson, 
then so-called dean of American critics, the leading uh, literary critic in this country, decided to review some of Lovecraft's works. And his judgment was not favorable. He said, in a book review that published in the New Yorker, 1945, the only real horror in most of these fictions is the horror of bad taste and bad art. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Well, Mr. Wilson may have thought he was burying Lovecraft, but Lovecraft refused to be buried. The first paperback edition of Lovecraft emerged right around that time, and they may not have been distributed widely, but they, again, set the stage uh, for his later renaissance. The 1950s actually were a rather lean period for Lovecraft's uh, work in general. Arkham House was going through some tough times, could not keep Lovecraft's work in print. Um, uh, they themselves only published a few titles in that whole decade. But interesting things were happening overseas. The first editions of Lovecraft in England appeared in, in uh, early 1951. A few years later, more surprisingly, Lovecraft became uh, translated into foreign languages. First in France in 1954, and then in Spain in 1957. The French, as they had done a century before with Poe, hailed Lovecraft as an exemplary writer of what they called the fantastique. The French had no prejudice against horror fiction as a literary genre, and so they championed Lovecraft. French, uh, 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 German translations, uh, Italian translations followed uh, soon thereafter. In the early 1960s, Arkham House was able to reprint uh, Lovecraft's fiction in three substantial volumes and keep those volumes in print. The revenue from those editions, for those editions actually came from those early film adaptations of Lovecraft. We remember them all. The Haunted Palace, Die Monster Die, The Shuttered Room. There can't be, and, and perhaps a little proof, but they, they, they gave some money to Arkham House and that was good. They, they started uh, planting the seed of Lovecraft's great uh, emergence as a figure in popular culture. Indeed, as the, 70s, as the 60s advanced, a very strange thing happened. Horror fiction all of a sudden became a best-selling phenomenon. Ira Levin published Rosemary's Baby in 1967. William Peter Blatty published uh, The Exorcist in 1971. And then the early novels of Stephen King started publication in the early 70s. Lovecraft rode the crest of that popularity. Those Arkham House editions were reprinted by Lancer books and then by Valentine books and sold over a million copies, apparently, over the next several years. So Lovecraft has become firmly implanted in popular consciousness, indeed to such an extent that uh, Time magazine took notice of Lovecraft in its June 11, 1973 issue in a, in a lengthy review. But popularity is one thing. Critical esteem is a very different thing. Literary history is littered with the corpses of popular writers who then faded from the scene and deserve to fade. Their popularity was a transient phenomenon uh, subject to time and, uh, and, and whim. Would Lovecraft meet that same fate? Perhaps not. What happened in the 1970s is that shortly after August Gerlach's death in 1971, a new crop of Lovecraft scholars emerged to take Lovecraft much more seriously than, than had been done in the past, to study him more searchingly with greater analytical skill. Critics like Dirk W. Mosley, Kenneth Fay, David E. Schultz, Barton Zanarmont, and Professor Brown, Peter Kenn. Their work was, in a sense, showcased at one of the great events that this city has held, the first World Fantasy Convention, held in, in Providence in 1975, theoretically to celebrate the entire realm of weird fiction, but it had a significant Lovecraft component, and there were many individuals, from Mosig uh, to uh, Fritz Leiber to Robert Bloch and Frank Belknap Long, who all came to celebrate Lovecraft's legacy. This is about the time when I emerged on the scene in a very tentative manner. As a teenager, I had read Lovecraft in my public library in Muncie, Indiana. And I knew that I had to study this curious Providence writer. I knew I had to come here to absorb the influence of Lovecraft and to, to, to get a sense of, of, of what he meant uh, as a writer and as a thinker. 
Luckily, I was accepted at Brown and spent the next six years there doing as much research as I possibly can while still attending classes. I did, I did a significant amount of work, including the bibliography, and, and I spent years correcting Lovecraft's texts. They had been printed with many errors in, in previous editions, but I, I corrected most of those. And these were reprinted by Arkham House in the 1980s. They gained a, a bit of a, a, attention, but, but Lovecraft was still very far from achieving uh, renown as a, as a leading writer of world literature. However, around that time, other scholars emerged. Stephen J. Maraconda, Robert M. Price with his very lively magazine, Crypt of Clue. Yeah. Will Murray, yeah, I hope Price is here somewhere. He's a great guy. Um, um, Robert H. Wall. The work of these scholars was uh, commemorated in another great event that took place here, the H.P. Lovecraft Centennial Conference, uh, held at Brown, uh, and uh, featuring many scholars from around the world who came to speak on a very hot August weekend. Uh, and at the end of that event, we had the unveiling of the H.P. Uh, Lovecraft Memorial plaque, which is now on the grounds of the John Hay Library. I think a lot of us at that time felt that maybe that was the, the, the acme of Lovecraft's recognition. A major university had sponsored uh, a, a good academic convention. He was a popular writer. Oh, what's this? Today, such writers as Caitlin Kiernan, Laird Barron, 
Willem Pugmire, Joe Pulver, Jason Brock, Lois Gresh, Cody Goodfellow, and many others are here today. And they will be speaking about what it means to write in the Lovecraftian literary tradition. And, even more surprisingly, Lovecraft has become a media figure. I mentioned those early film adaptations. Crude as they were, they laid the groundwork for better things to come. For the last 20 years or so, there has been an H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival in Portland, Oregon, every year, uh, run mostly by Andrew Migliori and now taken over by others. Uh, and it has featured filmmakers from around the world, showing films long, short and long. We have filmmakers uh, who have come here this weekend to discuss the very difficult art of translating Lovecraft's words into images. But there's more than that. Lovecraft's been on television. He's been adapted for comic books, for, for role-playing games, for interactive games, uh, for, for rock music, for classical music, and many other media. What has also happened is that Lovecraft has expanded around the world. Those early translations in Europe have given way to still newer editions. Lovecraft is now in Russian, in Estonian, in Turkish, in Serbo-Croatian, in Bengali, in Chinese, in Japanese, in modern Greek. Truly, Lovecraft belongs to the world. And yet, in the most fundamental sense, he remains a uniquely American, a uniquely Rhode Island phenomenon. Let us remember what is written on his tombstone at Swan Point Cemetery, not far from here. I am Providence. I am Providence. What a wealth of, 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 of meaning lies in those simple words. How profoundly they speak of Lovecraft's attachment to this city. Its architecture, its topography, its history, now almost 400 years old, its people. Lovecraft traveled up and down the eastern seaboard, from Quebec to Key West, but he always came back to Providence. It was not merely his home, it was his haven, it was his sanctuary. It was the only place he felt he belonged, the only place where he felt he could be the man and the writer he wished to be. And so it is fitting that we have come from the four corners of the earth to celebrate his life and his legacy. I have to believe that he Thank you for that uh, amazing. I remember uh, an article that Barton uh, St. Armand wrote, and I think Barton will be the starting one, uh, saying that uh, a, I believe a uh, Spanish writer had listed Lovecraft as one of the ten most important writers in the world of any language at any time. Uh, so on that note, I did promise uh, two surprises in the church. The first one is, yes, we have no bananas. Thank you again, Gigi. Uh, excuse me, that wasn't Gigi. Sure what that was. Um, Gigi has one more piece that she would like to play for us, and after that, we'll review one more surprise.
Thank you, Gigi. Uh, before we cross the street, Thomas Street, in fact, to see the show titled A Shadow Over Thomas Street, there's one thing that always mystified me about this beautiful building. It's a Baptist church, and I could never find the baptismal tank or the font, but it's a Baptist church. And um, I was so mystified by it that I actually came to a baptism here to solve the mystery. Now, H.P. Lovecraft was not baptized in this church. He was not baptized at all. The Baptists, of which his aunt and his family was with, felt that baptism happened at the age of 14 to 16 or something like that. And at that point, he had long ago given that up. But uh, with the permission of the First Baptist Church, does anyone know what a bapt baptismal tank is here? stained glass window back there, which is always very carefully kept in the room. Stan, I don't know where the lights are. But this is the baptismal, the baptistry of the baptismal tank, the First Baptist Church. So that's your second surprise of the weekend. Uh, enjoy your stay in Providence. Thank you, Necronomicon, and all the great people who helped us all around the city make this possible. And we're going to open right across the street. Thank you so much.